Okay, dear colleagues, hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Uh, let's begin our seminar for today. Today we have our speaker is Professor Apurva Hari, Hari from Indian Institute of Sciences. <clears throat> he will speak very intriguing title, Polymath 14, Groups with Norms. Please, uh, Apurva, you can start. Okay, thank you so much again for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be there virtually and uh, I only wish I could have been there you know, in person. Uh, Slava has been inviting me for several years and uh, somehow, uh, yeah, one thing and another, but now of course for a very sad reason I can't travel right now and yeah, hopefully this will change uh, in a year or two. Okay, so uh, let me make it full screen. Maybe that's, uh, I'm told that's always better in Google Meet. Yeah, so uh, I can't see anyone. So if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt. Yeah. So this is a talk which is very, very different from, you know, so I did my PhD in representation theory with Victor Ginsburg at Chicago, and I've been working on high state modules, and that's how I know Slava and so on. But this is nothing to do with high state modules or representation theory. It is a little bit of algebra, a little bit of analysis, and a little bit of geometry. Uh, together with a bit of probability as well. So uh, it's just all kinds of things, but very, very simple. Uh, simple uh, tools. I cannot and I will not use any uh, high power machinery. And it's just a nice talk for you to enjoy. So this is a question that I had that arose out of some probability uh, work I was doing. And it led to a, a new character, a fundamental new characterization of abelian groups, but not using algebra, but using analysis and using geometry. And that's the story I want to tell you. So this is a polymath project, which means there's a lot of people who contributed to it. Everything was done online. It was done on Terence Tao's blog. Uh, and uh, eventually, we wrote a paper, which uh, eventually appeared uh, in Algebra and Number Theory. But yeah, as I said, so this is the, the question is about groups having norms. So uh, let me uh, quickly tell you the question itself. So suppose G is a group. There are no restrictions. So it's a group with the multiplication. So it's not abelian necessarily. The unit, there are inverses. And there is a metric. DG is a translation invariant metric. So it's left invariant and right invariant. When is this metric a norm? Now, what do we mean by a norm? So of course, uh, we all know what, what is a norm in RN, in Euclidean space or in the Banach space. It's just some translation invariant metric. Uh, and it uh, scales linearly. Right? So if you take the norm of alpha times a vector v, then that is the modulus of alpha, absolute value alpha, times the norm of v. Right? That's the usual norm. Now, in a group, you cannot take alpha to be any scalar. You cannot take alpha to be root 2. But you can take alpha to be a positive integer or a negative integer or 0. So a norm, I will define a norm on a group to be precisely a metric such that the distance from the identity to g power n. So what is the multiplicative way to write a multiple of a vector? It's just the power of an element. right? So g times g times g times g, which would translate in additive notation to v plus v plus v plus v. So the distance from 1 to g to the n is absolute value n times the distance from 1 to g. The norm of n times g is n times the norm of g. That's exactly what it is. For the only n I can take are integers. And so when can I say that a group with a trans has, has a norm defined, on, which is a translation invariant metric which scales linearly? Uh, OK, here is one example that we all know. Euclidean space under addition is a group. And the Euclidean norm, or in fact, you can take any LP norm. That's a, that's a norm. More generally, I can take any Banach space and take any additive subgroup under plus, under addition. And that, that is a norm. That has a, the norm. It inherits the norm. Notice that, of course, such a group is obviously abelian. It's a subgroup of a Banach space. And it is torsion free. Right? If you multiply any vector which is non-zero times any integer which is non-zero, you get a non-zero vector. Uh, interestingly, the converse is true. So if you take any abelian and torsion free group, these conditions, then you can put a norm on it. In fact, you can embed it into a Banach space and therefore inherit the norm. So I'm going to tell you why uh, shortly. So this is a talk that is accessible to basically everybody. So, so uh, I'm actually going to give complete proofs of, I think, most of the result and uh, most of all the results I've mentioned. So this one will be very easy. It will be in one slide. Anyway, so any abelian and torsion free group I claim has a norm on it. Uh, uh, several possible norms, but I will give you at least one. So the question is, what about non-abelian groups? 
Can you give me an example of a non-abelian group with a translation invariant metric, which is a norm? And that was the question. Are there non-abelian groups with norms? Turns out no examples were known and no uh, no negative result was known. So, so, so what, what's the answer? It's as, as simple a question as that. Can a non-abelian group have a norm? Now, let me take a couple of slides to tell you why I came across this question. So uh, I was looking at probability, uh, some work in probability uh, uh, with a collaborator at Stanford. So before this job, I was in Stanford. And so we were looking at some probability papers and some results. So one of the cornerstones of 20th century probability, so you know, of course, Kolmogorov formalized probability. He axiomatized it in terms of sigma algebras and so on in the early 20th century. And then it made great progress. And one of the sort of crown jewels of the theory, sorry, excuse me, one of the cornerstones of the 20th century work is the to look at not just real valued random variables, but Euclidean space valued variables, or more generally, Banach space valued random variables. And then you look at the same kinds of things, like you know, maybe weak law or strong law, or central limit theorems kind of thing. And there's a famous book by Ledu and Talabran on, on this on this. But there are, of course, other settings that are you know, prominent. And for example, if you have seen the work of, say, Percy Diaconis about you know, if you shuffle a deck of cards seven times, then it's, it's sufficiently random and so on. That's just uh, shuffles are just permutations. So you, he's actually looking at random variables which are permutation group valued. And uh, a shuffle is literally like a Markov chain because you only care about the previous state, not all the past history to get to the next one. So things like Markov chains on permutation groups or metric spaces, probability with metric space valued random variables. There's a famous book by Parthasarthi. Probability with random variables taking values in semi groups or monoids and so on. And also with geometric flavor, you know, Lie groups and manifolds and manifold learning and so on. That's a popular topic these days. So uh, what we were interested in, my collaborator and I, we were interested in studying phenomena uh, in all of these settings at once. And that just means I want to find sort of the least assumptions, the least structure under which all of these, inside which all of these are subsumed, or many of these settings are subsumed. And so here are some examples of such primitive frameworks. So for example, we know Pythagoras theorem is this. It doesn't just hold in the plane or in Rn. It works in all Hilbert spaces. Right? So the primitive structure is that of an inner product space or a Hilbert space. In algebra, you have a plus b square is this. And since I write ab plus ba and not 2ab, this holds in any way, commutative or otherwise. But in fact, 1 minus 1 equals 0 is an even more primitive framework identity. It holds in any group. Right? It's just saying g times g inverse is 1. Really. That's all it's saying. And so in probability, what we were interested in was the idea of stochastic convergence. So here is a primitive framework. Suppose xn and x are random variables, and xn converges to x almost surely. Then xn converges to x in probability. And this is a very well-known fact in basic probability. It to state this fact, you just need the notion of a distance function, right? the notion of convergence. So you can talk about this statement. You can state it for random variables that take values in the metric space because you just need distance. The remarkable and nice property is that it, this statement can not only be formulated for a metric space, it can be proved in that generality. So the most general notion in which the most primitive framework in which you can frame a statement, you can also prove it. So now, so that, that was the idea of a primitive framework in which we wanted to study probability inequalities in various of these settings. And so what we were looking at was things like sums of independent random variables. So, uh, you know, if you divide that by square root n, then you go to a central limit theorem. If you divide it by n, maybe you go to weak law or strong law. I, yeah, well, strong law, let's say, yeah, of large numbers. And so, but of course, we were looking at uh, random variables that might take values in permutation groups. So you can't really divide by anything. So anyway, what do we want? Therefore, we want the notion of a sum, and we want the notion of convergence. So what this means is you need a binary operation, the sum or product or whatever, and you need a distance function for convergence. So what is the minimal structure required for that? It's what the title of the slide says. It's a semi-group, not even a group or a monoid, but a semi-group. I don't need an identity and a metric on it. So that's what we worked over. We worked over arbitrary semi-groups with a translation in metric. This includes all of various different examples, including the ones I stated above. And so in the paper in 2017 with my collaborator, uh, Bala Rajaratna, we showed uh, some fundamental stochastic inequality called the hoffman jorgensen inequality where the random variables take values in as primitive a framework as is needed to state the result. And in that framework, we prove the result as well. Okay. 
So there was a different preprint where we studied another such inequality called the Kinchin Kahan inequality, uh, which compares LP and LQ norms of, again, sums of independent random variables. And in that, we proved the following result. And this is the starting point of this talk. Every abelian normed metric group, so norm is what I defined initially. So every abelian non-metric group canonically and isometrically embeds in the smallest Banach space. Well, actually, yeah, canonically is slightly wrong, maybe, but it isometrically embeds in the smallest Banach space. So I'm actually going to construct one such smallest Banach space for you. Okay, and the idea, oh, actually, no, if I assume the group has a norm, then it's canonical as well. Great. So this statement is correct. Okay, and the idea is this is very nice because if I take an abelian non-metric group and I look at random variables that take values in this group, I can actually talk about the expectation of such a random variable. Obviously, the expectation involves, you know, like summing up over some probability, uh, averaging over some against some measure. And so you should really talk about a vector space. But this is just a group. So how do you take values? How does expectation get defined? The answer is because the group embeds in a Banach space, the expectation makes sense here through some kind of Bochner integration or something. And therefore, you can talk about the expectation of a g-valued random variable that might lie in g, or it really actually lies in the Banach space hub or the Banach envelope of G. Yeah. So, in, so in some sense, that's a nice construction. It helps extend things from Banach spaces to such norm metric groups. And so when we did this result and we used it to prove some things, I was I started wondering what about non-abelian setting? So because we see this this year in the 2017 paper in the Annals of Probability, we did not need abelianness. We did not even need an identity or inverses. Our result held for arbitrary metric setting groups. Here we do need to, it to be a group, but so could it be a non-abelian group? And then can one uh, understand such a result? Is there such an analog in such a case? And so I could not prove such a result in general. So I tried to say, okay, let me look for one example and try to prove this result or an analog of this in that example. And uh, to my surprise, I couldn't even find an example. And so the question was, uh, do, they, do these even exist? So now, okay, so now I move from probability to geometry. So non-abelian groups, forget the norm part, but at least with metrics, they occur in geometry. And there are very prominent examples, word metrics and free groups and monoids, or in geometric group theory, you have Riemannian metrics on the Lie group. Okay, so uh, at least I can tell that this talk has some Lie, Lie theory in it. So there's some references to Lie groups. But also, obviously, on compact Lie groups, you have more. You have bi-invariant metrics. So distance from, uh, this distance is unchanged under left translation by A, and right translation by B for all A and B. So you have a bunch of different kinds of metrics on groups and non-abelian groups, in fact, that show up in geometry. In geometry, the notion of... Uh, uh, I think your presentation has stopped. Uh-oh, it has stopped. Let me start it again. Resume. Okay. Why did it stop? Is it now fine? Uh, yeah, now is it fine? Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, these are the, uh, yeah, these were the examples I mentioned from geometry. Uh, but in geometry, uh, one thing that one talks about is not really a left invariant metric. One talks about a length function occasionally, especially in geometric group theory. And so a length function on a group or a monoid is just a function which is subadditive. The length of g times h is less than this. It is always positive for g not equal to 1, and of course it's 0 and 1. Now this, this should remind you, the first statement should remind you of the triangle inequality. And the second one should remind you of the positivity of a metric. Yeah, so it's really just the distance or the metric of a, the distance from an element g from 1. And that's what satisfies both 2 and 1. It satisfies 1 under a certain assumption. Okay? And that's if g is a monoid. If g is a group, then you want the length of g to be the length of g inverse, which is like the symmetry assumption. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I think some. Yeah. Okay, let me resume again. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So length functions are really exactly the same as left invariant metrics of groups. So the way you do it is if you take a left invariant metric and you take the length to be distance from one to g, that's the length of g. Then the length of g times h is the distance from one to g h, and that is less than the distance from one to g, plus the distance from g to g h, and the distance from g to g h being left invariant is the distance from one to h, and that is simply the length of h. So that's why a left invariant metric gives rise to a length function like this. Conversely, if you're given a length function, then you can get a left invariant metric by defining the distance in this way. The distance from g to h is the length of h inverse g. 
you can check that this distance function is indeed left invariant because the a inverse and a come in between. Okay. So that's just a different dictionary, what we call length, left invariant metrics, maybe in analysis or something like that, and probability, you would call a length function in geometric group theory. So now what is the notion of a norm in the same language of length functions? We call it homogeneous. It is accepted to be homogeneous. If the length of g to the n, the distance from 1 to g to the n, is n times the distance from 1 to g. So that's what homogeneity is. And so the real the question I'm asking is, can the length can a length function on any group be homogeneous if that group is not a period? There is a result of Milner, which says that if uh, in this famous that, that paper is apparently very famous. I am not a geometrist, so I, I really didn't know about it, but somebody told me. If G is a connected Lie group and G is not abelian, then no such metric exists, no such norm exists. Okay, so this homogeneous length function cannot exist. So at least in some special class, you have a negative result. Here is another calculation. If G is a nilpotent group and it has nilpotence degree 2, then such a norm cannot exist. And here is a very simple reason why. So the point is, if I take, let me take G h to the n, so the, sorry, let's look at the right hand side. G to the n, commutator with h to the n. So the point is, there are n square transactions. Every copy of G must be taken past every copy of H. Whenever you do that, you get a copy of the commutator, right? G bracket H. But the point is, since G has nilpotence degree 2, the commutator is lies in the center of the group. So you can take it to the side. Now that's one transaction less. And you do another transaction, you get another copy of the commutator. And you keep going. And eventually, you just get n square copies of the commutator for the n square transactions you make. So that explains this equality. But now suppose G has a norm function. Then I can take the lengths of both sides. And the length of this pure power is n squared times the length of G bracket H. So it grows quadratically. The, left, the right hand side is a, whatever this is. But you look at this, it's a word. It's a word in G and H. G to the n, H to the n, G to the minus n, H to the minus n. Right? So G inverse and H inverse. That's a word of length at most 4n. So the length of that by this subadditivity property here, the length of that is 4n times some constant, or it's bounded above by 4n times some constant. So it grows at most linear. And it is supposed to equal the length of the left-hand side, which grows quadratically. How can that happen unless the length is 0? Yeah. But the length is 0 means that this commutator must be 0. The commutator must be 1, because the only element whose length is 0 is the identity. If the commutator is 1, then g and h commute. So basically, you would check that if, if you had two non commuting elements, then this cannot hold. And so such a norm cannot exist because G is nilpotent of degree 2. Okay. And so there are at least two classes of groups for which a norm cannot exist, non abelian groups. Well, on the other hand, if G is a free monoid, monoid, not a group, then the, such a norm always exists. For every free monoid, there is a norm. One can prove that. And in our paper, we mentioned the construction. So now the question is, OK, for monoids, it's always true for free monoids. For various groups, it's always, it's never true. What is the answer for general groups? Can we at least find one example of a non-abelian group with a norm? And so with that motivation, here is the main result. And so as I said, this was published under the name of DHJ Polymath in the tradition of polymath projects. It appeared in this journal uh, in late 2018. So it's a couple of years old. But the story is still almost, you know, it's, it's very fresh. So uh, it's still very nice. So given a group G, the following are equivalent. Uh, here is a condition from algebra. G is abelian and torsion free. If and only if, from analysis, G is a metric space, the original setting. G is a metric space with a norm, meaning there's a translation invariant metric that satisfies this norm condition for all G in G and all integers. Set. If and only if, from geometry, G, is a, G admits a length function that's just a left invariant metric, not a translation invariant metric, but just a left invariant. Such that it is, I don't even need it to be homogeneous for all n like this. I just need it to be too homogeneous. That's it. If and only if G embeds isometrically and additively in the Banach space. So isometric, if I assume that it has a norm, then that's if and only if isometric. If G is abelian and torsion free, then it does not have a God given norm on it. So then it just embeds additively in the Banach space. So basically, the only examples of, of groups with norms, as in the title of the talk, are precisely the ones I told you on the first slide. The Euclidean space with a subgroup, or more generally, any Banach space and an abelian subgroup. Those are the only ones that are groups with norms. There is no others. And that is a characterization of abelian and torsion-free groups. 
So this is in some sense a slogan for the unity of mathematics. You know, if you are an algebraist, then here is an analysis characterization of an abelian and torsion-free group. We all study you know, algebraic characterizations of things in algebra courses, but here is an analysis one. It's a, it's a metric space with a norm. It's a group with a norm. That's an abelian and torsion figure. If you're an analyst, then here is a geometric characterization of a subgroup of a Banach space. It's just any group with no restrictions that admits a length function with this two homogeneity property, not even n homogeneous. That is the same as saying it's a subgroup of a Banach space. So you know, the, all these things are equivalent. And maybe uh, I certainly was reminded at this point uh, of a quote of Herman Weil, in these days, the angel of topology and the devil of abstract algebra uh, fight for the soul of every individual discipline of mathematics. That was apparently attributed to Weil. But at least from this result, it sometimes appears that angels and demons can sometimes be one and the same, right? because these are all equivalent. OK. So uh, yeah, so let's, let's so my, I, the goal of the rest of this talk is to actually prove these results. So I'm going to prove everything for you, if I can. So clearly, if G embeds in the Banach space, then it's abelian and torsion free. And it's a metric space that admits a norm. And of course, 2 implies 3 is obvious. If it is bi-invariant, then it's left invariant. And if it's n homogeneous for all n, then it is 2 homogeneous. So all these implications are trivial. On the next slide, I'm going to tell you why every abelian and torsion free group embeds into a Banach space. Remember, I told you that in the first or second slide. Conversely, every such group has a norm on it. I'll tell you that using Zorn's lemma. Next, I'm going to tell you why a 2 homogeneous group is always n homogeneous. So that's 3 implies 2. Also, I will need to prove right invariant, but I will also do that. Yeah. And then the final and highly non-trivial assertion, and that is what was the meat of this polymath paper, is why is, if I know that I have a bi-invariant metric, or maybe just a left invariant metric with a 2 homogeneity or a norm, why is that group abelian? Torsion-free is easy. Why is it abelian? And that turns out to involve very clever arguments, but because uh, the group is so general, there is no restriction on the group. I can't even use silo theorems or you know, anything about free groups. We can use nothing, literally, and yet one is able to prove that the group is abelian. And so that's the, the story of that discovery is what I want to tell. Okay. So why does one imply four, meaning read the title, why do abelian torsion free groups embed into Banach spaces? So I'm actually going to construct, as I said, I promised you one Banach space, I'm going to construct the smallest Banach space into which this embeds. Suppose G is abelian and torsion free, then it is a subgroup of this real vector space. Notice that this is a very large vector space in principle. So for example, if G is the real line, what is the smallest Banach space in which R embeds? It is R itself. Okay? But this subgroup is R tensor product of R over Z. That is an enormous dimensional uh, vector space. That is not R itself. It's much bigger. Anyway, the point is, if you have any real vector space, then that has a norm on it by Zorn's lemma. For example, take any basis, take any R basis, and take the L1 norm with respect to the coefficients with respect to that basis. That's a norm. It's easy to check. So now what I do is I don't take this R vector space. I take the Q vector subspace of this, which is G tensor Q over Z. Okay, That is a Q vector space, and it inherits, the L1, it inherits this norm. And now you see this is a much smaller vector space a priori than this. So if G is R, the real line, this is huge. But this is back to being R itself, because all this is saying is I can take fractions, denominators. And in the real line, you can. And now it's very simple. Now you do the standard analysis construction. Until now, we were doing sort of algebra and a set theory bit. But now it's analysis. Take the Cauchy completion of this. So there's a metric. And this is you can take the Cauchy completion. And you can even define a real vector space structure in the following way. Given the real number and given the Cauchy sequence, let's define R times B to be literally take rational numbers converging there take qn xn you can check this qn xn is also cauchy therefore this is a valid cauchy sequence that's what i define not only that this choice this cauchiness is independent of the cauchy sequence specific sequence and the norm makes sense the norms of the xn's converge and therefore so does a, and you define that limit to be the norm of this b, of the cauchy sequence you can check that this is a you can check this is actually a norm you can check that this is obviously complete because it's the cauchy completion and so it's a Banach space. But not only is it a Banach space, uh, it is indeed the smallest Banach space containing uh, G. Because if B prime is any Banach space containing G, then B prime must contain this vector space, this Q vector space. And therefore, B prime being complete, it must contain the Cauchy completion. So B prime must contain B. So this is why it's the smallest Banach space containing it. Yeah. OK? So, uh, so that's why any abelian and torsion free group can be embedded into a Banach space. So that's one implies four. So one is if and only four. 
virus three in flight two. So I'm getting all the small bits out of the way, and then I will get to the main result. So why are two homogeneous length functions on groups homogeneous? So this is a this is not too bad either. So this is suppose a length function that is two homogeneous. Length of g square is twice length of g. So I'm actually going to prove that the length of g power n is n times the length of g. So length of g to the fourth is four times length of g. And in general, you can do this for every power of two by induction. But now, what about non-powers of two? And it's not too bad. What you do is you take a larger power that's bigger than than six, let's say. And now you write this. Now you write down the sequence of inequalities. You start with eight times the length of g, which is the length of g to the eight because of this induction. And now you use the triangle. In, you use the subadditive property. Uh, that's length of g to the eight is less than g to the six plus g plus g. And now g to the six is less than six times length of g, just by another use of the subadditivity. And so you get back. So you start with eight length of g and you get to an eight length of g. So everything in between is an equality. So this one is an equality. And this means the length of g to the six equals six times the length of g, and we are done. And this is for every positive integer m, positive power. But you can similarly do negative powers because that's the same. It's by symmetry. Okay, so that's why uh, two homogeneous length functions are homogeneous. But the proof of three implies two is not complete because I also need to prove that if I have a two homogeneous length function. Which is left invariant metric, then that metric must be right invariant as well. So I have not yet proved the right invariance. And uh, okay, we'll do that. So now let's get to the main event. So suppose D is a norm group. Okay, so it's any group with a norm. The non-trivial implication is this: uh, two implies one. G must be abelian and torsion-free. Okay, the torsion-free part is immediate, so I won't even spend time. If G to the n is one, but G is not one, then this distance is zero because this is one. But this G is not one, so n equals zero. So uh, uh, there are some consequences. So, for example, if G is nilpotent, then G is abelian. I proved that above, right? because in G, if G is nilpotent, it contains a nilpotent subgroup of order two of nilpotent degree two, but that can't happen. Another part is so this was something that I was wondering about: is if every abelian torsion-free group, as I said in the probability motivation, it embeds into a Banach space. Actually, I proved it a couple of slides above. Can that have a non-abelian counterpart? That was, as, as you remember, that was the question we started out with. You know, how does one do that? And uh, well, what, so the answer turns out to be no. Under a suitable definition of what is an analog of a Banach space in a non-abelian group setting. So if you if you if you allow me to assume that the analog of a Banach space is a geodesically complete non-abelian group, right? So the point of Banach space is it's complete, but also between any two points there is a unique geodesic. That's the straight line joining. Right, so the analog of that is a geodesically complete non-abelian group or D groups with translation invariant metrics, uh, uh, let's say. And so, if you have such a group with a bi-invariant metric, then as I said, Milner proved in this paper in '76 that these groups don't exist. Non-abelian groups cannot have norms. So why? Well, every such connected Lie group with a translation invariant metric looks like this. It's R n cross k for a compact group k. Now, if you have a norm, if you have a metric on the compact group. Then that metric is necessarily bounded. But on the other hand, if you have any non-trivial element, right? Uh, Torsion-free is immediate. So if you have a norm, then the group is torsion-free. So the compact group is torsion-free. So you take any g not equal to one here, and you look at the powers of g. Right? If g is not equal to one, then the distance from one to g is positive. So this distance goes unbounded. So the distance from one to the powers of g is unbounded. But that has to be bounded above by the diameter of the compact group. So how can that happen? So that's a contradiction. And so the point is, if G is norm, then the compact group is bounded and therefore trivial. You cannot have a G not equal to one in the compact metric norm group. But if K is trivial, then this is abelian because this is R n. So that's why you cannot have non-abelian groups by Milner's thing. So that was why. So non-abelian Lie groups cannot be norm. What about the general groups? I told you the main result that we proved was it cannot be norm. It has to be abelian to have a norm. Why? So, uh, so. Here is a small reduction. Suppose I take two elements that don't commute, right? If I take, suppose I have a non-abelian group with a norm on it, then since there are these two elements, I can look at the subgroup generated by them. That is another non-abelian smaller group with the same norm on it. It, it inherits the norm, right? The translation invariant and the scaling invariant metric. So the worst case, the case when you don't have any other information to play with, <clears throat> is the case when this is the free group. So, for example, can the free group on two generators have the norm have a norm on it? It's non-abelian. 
And so just to remind you as, and to set some notation, the free group is the collection of two strings, of strings in four letters, alpha, beta, alpha bar, which is the inverse, and beta bar. You multiply strings by concatenating and canceling out mute, uh, con consecutive inverse elements. And you take inverses as usual. The question is how to prove there is no norm. So the idea is so the idea that turned out to help was that we want to show that any such norm must satisfy that the norm of a commutator is zero. Why so? Because if the norm of a commutator is zero, what can the commutator be? It has to be equal to one. It has to be the identity function, identity element. But then that means that alpha beta equals beta alpha, right? You can take these to the other side. So and more generally, we would like to do this. Or this is a technical point about Fermi pseudometric and so on. But anyway, so, that, so that's where the matter lay. So as I said, I think I proved we proved this result preprint in 2016. We had brought up this preprint or something. So anyway, the question had been bothering me for at least a year or maybe more. And I emailed lots of people. I emailed, actually started by emailing Shlomo Sternberg at Harvard uh, and asked him, is this question true? And he replied back in a day and said he didn't know the answer. And that led me to email people all across the East Coast and the West Coast and Northwestern and Northeastern and anywhere else. But somehow, yeah, nothing was known. So neither was there an example anybody could give me. Now we know that these examples don't exist, nor was there a non-existence result. Uh, eventually, I was visiting uh, Terence Tao in December 2017 for uh, a different paper. We were collaborating on that paper, which, uh, yeah, which itself got accepted, but only last month or two months ago or something. Anyway. So, uh, but so what we discussed was the strategy for F2. Can we, how do we tackle this problem? Uh, we ended up discussing this question instead. And so we discussed how does one tackle the problem for the free group? So suppose it's pseudo normed or equivalently has a homogeneous pseudo length function like this, which means it satisfies the length is less equals, it's subadditive and the length is a norm. So it's homogeneous. Yeah. But I don't need to assume that the length is zero only at g equals one and so on. It may be zero elsewhere. Can we prove that the length of alpha beta, the commutator, is zero? So to do that, we discussed, so try to prove uh, that the length of this commutator is less equal some number times a length of alpha plus some number times length of beta, and so on. And then, sorry, and then take, try to see if you can improve these upper bounds, make them smaller and smaller until all of them go down to zero. If that happens, then you're done, right? Because then the length of alpha beta is less equals every positive real number, and so it's zero. So for example, let me give you some examples. So for example, the length of alpha beta, which is this, is less by the triangle inequality or by subadditivity than the length of alpha plus length of beta plus alpha bar plus beta bar. That means I get one, 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 one. So I just get four. Okay. So more generally now, let me, <coughs> sorry, let me get rid of these length of alpha, beta, and so on. Let's, you can, you can divide everything. You can divide the length function by some big positive number so that all of these guys are less equals one that neither changes these assumptions, nor does it change the question. So I can always rescale the entire length function, and I do so to assume the max is less equal to 1. And then I try to prove that the length of the commutator is less than C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C4. And I ask, how much can I keep improving? Right now I have 4. Can I go down to 0? Okay. And this is where I'm now starting to go. I'm going to use the conjugation invariance. So the point is, why should the length function be conjugate invariant? You can check that just as uh, the length function uh, uh, being subadditive is the same as sort of giving us uh, left invariance in some sense, or a length function gives us a left invariant metric. If I also have that metric to be right invariant, then that would mean that that would translate in the same dictionary to the length function being conjugate invariant. That's not too hard to check. Okay. If I knew that, I haven't proved it for you yet. I, I will tell you the proof in two lines on the next slide. But if I knew that, then I could break this alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar in a better way. I could break it as alpha times the rest. Okay. So length of it's less than alpha plus length of the rest. And this guy is a conjugate. Therefore, the length of this equals the length of alpha bar. And so I just get 1 plus 1, which is 2. So from 4, I brought it down to 2. Okay. But now I'm going to claim I can even do better. I can do 4 over 3. Okay. And so there are all these clever games. And so these three estimates were what Terry Tao and I worked out in his office. And so uh, this is, uh, how does you get 4 over 3? So you want to prove that the length of this guy is less than 4 over 3. Uh, if you try to back, back calculate, work backwards, you want to prove that 3 times the length is less than 4. But because it's a norm, it's a length function, 3 times the length of an element is the length of this element cube. 
and this is a four element string so the cube is a 12 element string and now that's what i do the length of alpha beta bracket is the one third the length of its cube but that's a 12 element string and i break it up into groups of three each this 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 and you see each of these guys is a conjugate so if i knew that my length function was conjugate invariant then this is the length less than the length of this plus length of this plus length of this plus length of this and those lengths are equal to these lengths my conjugate invariants therefore i get four over three so you see from four to four over two to four over three uh, so these are not too bad and at that point so the question remains can you get better and better estimates so that this length this summation decreases to zero and that's where we stopped and i had to you know, go back to uh, san francisco uh, to fly back to india so i was visiting him from india so uh, he so i landed at san francisco that night the next morning was my flight and at night i get an email from tau saying you know can i uh, can i post this on my blog uh, so that you know uh, maybe other people can try to work on and so i said of course please go ahead and so the next morning he posted it on his blog i think and i flew back to india so i'm going to tell a story uh, side by side with the mathematics so this is the story here's a curious question posed to me by purva that i don't know the answer to so he explains the question on the free group but of course we were interested in the answer for every group uh, and then he explains the four three and four over three and then says what is not clear to me is if one can keep arguing like this to continually improve the upper bounds to the point where this norm would in fact vanish it is also tempting to use some ideas from geometric group theory and so on anyway this feels like a problem that might be receptive to a crowdsource attack and so i am posing it here and so now let me start telling you the timeline i have put the times in uh, india time so uh, sorry for that so anyway so he posted it out i guess he posted it at night in uh, los angeles with including these estimates that i told you uh, at night in los angeles was i guess morning in germany where uh, one of our collaborators tobias fritz was uh, i guess waking up to his breakfast and coffee and in three hours after this got posted tobias immediately proved what i have not told you yet and if you have a left invariant metric with a norm, then you're also right invariant. Okay? And, or in other words, the length function is conjugate invariant. That is equivalent to the metric being right invariant. So that was in three hours. And I'm going to prove it for you in the remaining space in this slide here. So, so Tobias's lemma is that if uh, the length is, G, uh, is a homogeneous length function, then L is conjugate invariant. And that's if and only if the associated metric is right invariant, as I'm showing you here. The distance from GB to HB would be the length of h inverse g remember that was how you construct the length so h inverse g is b inverse h inverse gb and uh, so that is conjugate invariant if the, if the length function is conjugate invariant like this then the metric itself is right invariant because the length of h inverse g is also the distance from g to g okay so this is actually if and only anyway so how do you prove this statement <coughs> the proof is even smaller okay it's really two or three lines here Take a large integer n and multiply the length of this conjugate by n. Now, because you're talking about a norm or a homogeneous length function, this is the same as the length of the power, of the nth power, which is the length of this function, this element. But now by the triangle inequality or subarditivity, this is less than twice length g because the length of g inverse was length of g, plus n times the length of h. And now you use, as I said, we cannot really use any tools because we are given a completely general group with nothing no structure no assumptions but now you use something called the archimedean property of real numbers and this is maybe one of the few times in my life when i have appreciated truly appreciated the power of the archimedean property divide both sides by n and take n to infinity and you get that the length of g a g inverse is less than the length of h okay. that's that's the power of the archimedean property and nothing more and so if you're smaller than any real number any positive real number then you must be less equal to zero and that's what we use this is one way, and obviously, since the notion of conjugation is equal, is a symmetric relation, you get the other way by symmetry. And so you're done. And so that's that's this conjugation in variance. So now, okay, so now that's that's that addresses the loose ends from earlier. Everything else is done. We just need to now prove that the group is abelian, and that's all, right? Or more more precisely, that the length of a commutator element is zero. Or even more precisely, the length of the commutator is smaller than any positive real number. Okay. So uh, Tobias did this, and then there were some. So actually, what happened is after this, after this, people actually started to try and find an example of such a group. And the next two days, two days were spent in trying to find that using winding numbers and loops and various ideas from algebraic topology and free groups and free monoids and yeah, all kinds of things. But as the main theorem now tells us, of course, such groups don't exist. 
So after two days, I think people sort of said, okay, this doesn't seem to be working out. Let's come back to try to prove that these estimates can be brought, these bounds can be brought down to zero. So we had the bounds at this four over three. Tobias in three hours, as I said, did this thing, Tobias Fritz. But then after two days, people went back to these bounds. From four over three, there was the next improvement was to five over four. All these things are on the blog, in Terry Tao's blog. You can see it in the comment section. So you can read all the crazy, clever word games and conjugations that people used to do 5 over 4. That's the improvement of 1 12th. And then to 19 over 16, which was improvement of 1 20th, or 1, 1 16th, I guess. And uh, then there were some other things in between, I think. Eventually, but you see, all of these were bigger than 1. Eventually, somebody managed to make it go less than 1 with some extremely complicated ideas and proofs. Okay? Uh, but anyway, each of these seems to be like, you know, it's going down to a positive real number and I want it to go down to zero. So in principle, even if you do more and more of these tricks, you will always keep reducing to a positive real number. So you have to do infinitely many reductions and each of them might involve cleverer and cleverer word games. All these commutator, you write into four different parts and conjugations and this and that. And that is sort of where this point is where sort of our human intuition broke down. And there was for almost 24 hours, no improvement. None whatsoever from 22 over 23. And at this point, so this is really a 21st century paper because you know the problem was posed to the entire world. It was posed on a blog. The entire calculations and derivations and proofs were done on the blog in the comment section. And it got it got done rapid fire because it got finished. Two days got lost in that, and almost one day got lost between this point and the next progress. But other than that, it got finished in two more days. Overall, in five days, I think the whole problem got solved. And you can't imagine, you know, like Newton writing a letter to Leibniz and Gauss writing to somebody and Fermat. This is a very 21st century paper. It involves all these blogs and the full power of the internet, people working on it the world over. And, and very critically, when all human intuition broke down, a computer assisted proof helped. So uh, my colleague here, Siddharth Gargil, uh, so uh, programmed the computer. So he was at the same time trying to find examples that work in those first two days using winding numbers and so on and at the same time he was also programming a computer to try and see what if it doesn't work how do you show it? and so his idea was very simple he said that if the length of the commutator is supposed to be close to zero or is supposed to be zero itself or very very small positive number then if you take a large power of that and multiply by alpha then that should be close to length of alpha by the triangle inequality let's say right and hence it should be less equals one or very very just above one for large values of k, like for k going to infinity almost. And so he programmed the computer to search for something like this. And he found it. And not only did he find it, within the next two hours, somebody decoded that entire computer output. So here is his, so here is first of all the timeline. On the 20th of December in India, let's say, at 11 a.m., one somebody got 22 or 23, somewhere, somebody in the world. And then 21st December, 9.30 a.m., this was improved by Siddhartha to 0.816 from 0.95. So you know this is almost like a 100 meter race and people are shaving off hundredths of a second and a tenth of a second. And this was really shaving off almost 0.15. And that is a huge improvement. Of course, we want to go to zero. So this is still as insignificant as anything else. Here is Siddhartha's proof. He made, he made the computer write it down in a good format. Here is a computer generated proof for a linear uh, norm on the free group. Okay. And so it's literally start. the proof is written like an undergraduate understands the proof. It's a finite set of statements, each statement following from the ones previous to it, using only the axioms of mathematics and the given given conditions, right? So axioms of the in the theorem, the hypotheses. So the norm of alpha bar is less than one, implies the norm of this conjugate is less than one, because Tobias had proved conjugate invariance. The norm of beta bar is less than one, so this conjugate is less than one, the length. And so you keep going, keep going, keep going until the norm of <laughs> You get this long, enormous string, and step number 125 is a alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar, alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar. And you see there are 17 occurrences of this string. This is a 17 times 4, 68 string, ASCII character string. And this norm is less equals 13.859 something something using some previous statements. Because of this, now you can, this is, but this is the 17th power of the commutator. So I can divide both sides by 17. And once I do that, I take, I get the norm of the length of the commutator is less than this number over 17, which is exactly 0.816, uh, is approximately 0.816. So that is how he got it. 
Okay, he posted this at 8 p.m. UCLA time. This is in uh, Terry Tao's blog. Exactly 100 minutes later, Pace Nielsen, who is another collaborator, actually said that, you know, he read through the entire code and he said that uh, the first 43 lines I checked, the first 43 lines established this thing. He wrote it in terms of x, y rather than alpha, beta. is less than this thing times the norm of x plus this term norm of y. That means that the c1 plus c2 is now 20 over 18 plus 1. So it's slightly above 2 or something like that. And now the next few lines establish 18 over 18, 1 plus 10 over 18. That's slightly above 1 and a half. And then finally it comes down to something less than 1. Okay. And uh, this was very well done. And here is how to improve it. So he not only read and understood 126 lines of code, he internalized it, he absorbed it, and he explained how to improve all of these things. So that was pretty remarkable, I thought, because it was done in less than two hours. Okay. Uh, okay, <clears throat> and now, so once uh, Pace Nielsen explained these improvements as well, then people worked on it, and eventually, uh, I think this was Terry Tao who formulated, who distilled the essence of all these calculations into the following level. Suppose x, y, z, x, y, z, and w are four elements in any group with a homogeneous length function. I don't know that my group is abelian, but what I will know is that the length of x is less equal to the length of y plus the length of z over two provided x is conjugate to both wy and to zw inverse. The remarkable thing is that the length does not depend on w. Okay. And the proof is, again, it's going to fit on this slide. It's a beautiful proof. Here is the proof. So first of all, let's write down x is conjugate to wy. So it is s wy s inverse. And x is conjugate to zw inverse. So it is t times this times t inverse. Right. Now let me write down the same idea as what Pace Nielsen had. Take a large even power of x, x to the n times x to the n. The first n one of n of them, I'll write down in this way. The last n of them I write down in this way using the other one. So you get the nth power of the element in between and the same conjugation. Now do not read this line. Do not read this line. Look at the picture instead. You get s, wy, 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 s bar, s bar is the inverse, times t, z w bar, z w bar, z w bar, times t inverse. So I want to talk about the length of x to the 2n, which is the length of this huge string. Let's just do the triangle inequality. It's less than the length of s plus the length of t bar plus the length of the entire string in between. But that string in between is a conjugate. There's a w here and a w bar there. And I know that my length function is conjugate invariant. So I can remove the w and the w bar. and They are gone. They don't occur. Then I get, again, I, I get the length of the string in between. I take out less equals length of s plus length of y, length of c plus length of t bar, and then everything in between. <clears throat> but again, everything in between is again a conjugate. So I again remove my w and w bar. Then I again get a y and a z. <clears throat> and I again remove a w and w bar, and I keep going, I keep going. So eventually, every single w and w bar gets removed. There is no dependence on those. And I get all the individual elements. There's an s, an s bar, a t, a t bar, n many y's and n many z's. So I get n times length of y plus length of z and the length of this extra term. And now you know what to do. Right? Divide both sides by 2n. You get n over 2n, so 1 over 2 of this, plus something that goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. And therefore, I'm done. Now, the power of this tool, so this I'm just going to show you one power of this. But this is really what one can distill out of that calculation. Okay, I'm going to show you a sample application of this. In this one slide, without using any other clever tricks, I'm just going to use my conjugation invariance and this internal repetition lemma. And I'm going to beat that bound that Siddharth obtained, 0.816, or his computer obtained. Just on that one slide, I'm going to prove for you a bound of 0.727272, which is a huge improvement again over this one. So it's shaving off another tenth of a second, if you will, right? So you choose elements carefully, and you can check that this element if you take x, y, z, and w this way, then x is conjugate to w, y, and z, w inverse. It's very easy to check that. It's just one extra element. Therefore, by the lemma, the length of x, which is this commutator squared times alpha, is less than half length of y plus half length of z. Well, what is the length of y? It's a conjugate. So the length of this conjugate, I can remove the alpha bar and alpha. So the length of y is the length of this and this. It's less equals the length of these three elements plus these three. Well, each of those is a conjugate, and so I get one plus 1. The length of y is at most 2. Similarly, the length of z is at most 2. So I get half of 2 plus 2, which is 2. Okay, so as a preliminary step, I get the length of y is length of alpha beta square alpha, that is less equals 2. 
just from the lemma. And now I claim that 8 over 11 works. So earlier I had what, 22 over, no, I had 0.816. But now this is 0.72. Indeed, how do you prove that? The same way as we did 4 over 3. We multiply 11 times the length of the commutator. That's the length of this to the 11. That's a 44 element string. I write it down as 11 elements times 11 elements times 11 times 11. And each of these, again, you see, is a conjugate. So that is less than the length of this 9 element string plus the length of this 9 element string. That's just the triangle inequality plus the length of this plus this. Those are the strings I've written out here. But every one of these strings looks exactly like this. And so the same calculations analogs give me 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, and I get 8. So just using this lemma once here and using conjugate invariance here, I, I just destroyed that upper bound. Right? So this just completely beats the previous best bound of 0.816. So that's the power of this internal repetition trick that Siddhartha obtained from his uh, computer. Pace Nielsen showed how to improve, and then Terry Tau uh, formulated it in this way. Okay. But even still, you see that I go from 22 over 23 or 4 or whatever to this number, to this number. All of these are finite improvements. And by finite, I mean logarithmically finite improvements. I have some log of this is some negative number. I get from there the log of this, which is a bigger negative number. I want to get to 0, meaning the log of 0 is minus infinity. I don't want finite logarithmic improvements. I want to go all the way down to, logarithm, uh, to, uh, the, to, log of, to minus infinity as the log of 0. How do I keep going? Do I need one more trick? Do I need another trick? Luckily, I don't. Right? So already we are at the 50 minute mark. So I better not have more tricks in store. But yeah, it turns out that this internal repetition trick and the conjugation invariance and homogeneity, of course, are enough to prove the theorem. And so I'm going to uh, sort of uh, prove that the last part is slightly more tricky. But it is you can write it down entirely using binomial combinatorial. So I told you the motivation from probability. I told you the language of geometry. I told you the problem in terms of analysis in algebra. So it's time to include combinatorics as well, right? As another of the main areas of mathematics. Why should it be left out? So uh, yes, the whole thing can be done, the rest of it using binomial combinatorics. But that is more easily phrased, more compactly stated using the language of probability again. So we started with probability motivations, and we'll end with probability and just binomial distribution. Nothing more than binomial. No central limit theorem, no weak law, just binomial or a shifted binomial. So first of all, one shows this. So this is again a corollary that was first observed to us by Tobias Fritz. He said that this looks like that condition that you have will allow us to use, uh, to de develop some kind of a discrete heat equation. So remember Siddharth's idea was that to, to program his computer was to take alpha beta to the k for large k times alpha to the one. Tobias said, no, let me take all possible integers k and all possible integer powers m. And let's define the function of two variables given a homogeneous length function to be alpha to the m, alpha beta to the k, length. Then that internal repetition trick applies to give you this. OK, just some functional inequality, which, as I said, Tobias called the discrete heat equation. We will write this in probabilistic form. From the, so this slide and the next slide, I'm just going to write probabilities, and then that's the end of the proof. Let y equals plus minus 1 with probability half. So it's like a fair coin. But the binomial variable takes values 0 and 1. The Rademacher variable takes values minus 1 and 1. Okay, so it's just the same as a shifted binomial variable. Let y be such a Rademacher variable. Then what this, this theorem above is saying is that the function of m comma k is the expectation of m comma k minus a half plus y times 1 comma minus half. Right? Because that, what does expectation mean? It means that with, you take this with y equals 1. You take this with y equals minus 1. Add the 2 and divide by 2. That's all. And you check that that's exactly m minus 1 times k minus half minus half k minus. Sorry, m minus 1 uh, so times k minus half plus half. And m plus 1 times k minus half minus half. So that, yeah. And divided by 2. And the key point here is that you see that from f of m comma k, you get to f of m comma k minus a half. So what we are going to do is we are going to take alpha to the 0, alpha beta to the n for a large n and i'm going to apply this thing two n times every single time the second coordinate reduces by half so if i take 0 comma k and apply uh, 0 comma n here and apply 2 n times expectations of this uh, i mean basically if i add 2 n many distinct iid random variables of this kind and i take the expectation 
then each time I add such a variable, I will reduce half here. And if I started with n, then by adding two n variables, I get 0, comma 0. And so I get a purely probabilistic statement. And so this is that f of 0, comma n, length of alpha beta to the n, sorry, not 2n. Uh, I take alpha beta to the n, and I do this expectation business 2n times. I get 0, comma 0 plus this number. Here, y1, y2, y2n are iid, Rademacher variables. And uh, of course, because these are both uh, always either odd or even, uh, they're always odd. Therefore, a sum of even number of them is always even number. And so times minus 1 half is an integer. So f, remember, was defined only on the integers. But this makes sense, f of an integer comma integer. Now here is so, as I said, I'm going to finish the proof here. Uh, the proof is now not too bad. Uh, let y, let's script y with this random variable. It's basically a shifted binomial variable now. Then by the triangle inequality. So first of all, what is f of this y? This is, forget the expectation. f of shift script y times this thing is what <clears throat> it is. First, what is the definition of f of y of this thing? It is alpha to this power times alpha beta to the minus y over 2. Remember, y is an even. It always takes even values. So the commutator to the some even to some integer and alpha to some integer. So the length, so this is first of all bigger equals 0. So even before I take expectation now, just look at the, this, this quantity without taking expectations. This quantity equals some length function. Therefore, it is non-negative. But also, it is bounded above by what? It is the length of this number, these, number, these many alphas and these many commutators. So this is linearly growing in script y. So it is, again, some constant times the length of, times the, uh, times the absolute value of this uh, y, right? So meaning this y is some even a positive or negative integer. And so this is this. Great. So I get a bound, an upper bound on this length function, right? In particular, now, now I take my f of 0, comma n. Now I go back to this inequality. f of 0, comma n is length of alpha to the, uh, it, it, sorry, it's f of 0, comma n is the ex, less equals expected value of this guy. Right? But this guy is less equals, uh, well, by the monotonicity of expectations, the expected value of this f is less than a times the expected value of mod y. And here is the big, big point. The all important point is if you take a sum of, if you take a binomial variable or a shifted binomial variable, and you take the standard deviation, which is what this is. Or well, okay. Let's let's first say by Jensen's inequality or some kind of Cauchy Schwartz that the expected of mod y is less than the variance itself or the square root of the variance. But now the big important point to remember is what one uses in proving the weak law as well, weak law of large numbers. If you take a sum of binomials, then the variance is linear and the expectation is square root. So it grows slower than quadratic. In particular, because this is the variance again, a uh, shifted variance, this number is linear. So this this with the square root here, you get square root. So because y has mean 0 and variance 2n, so the length, so this f of 0, comma n, which is the length of the commutator, is less than the expected value of this number, as I said. And that is less equals a times the square root 2n, because y has variance 2n. And now we are done, right? Because what do you have? You have the nth power of this thing. What is the length? It is n times the length of alpha beta is less than some constant times something that grows slower than linear. So divide both sides by n, then n goes to infinity. This is a over or a root 2 over root n that goes to 0. And the length of alpha beta, therefore, is bounded above by some sequence that goes to 0. And so we are done. The length of the commutator must be 0. In particular, the commutator must be 1, and therefore, g is a so I'll just tell you the last, so as, as, a, as an afterword, maybe. Uh, this, the proof technique is robust enough that one can have, one can get quantitative results. So meaning, suppose I have, so this is maybe the more, the more slightly more stronger result than our main theorem, because we have quantitative estimates as well. Suppose my triangle inequality is not quite true. Suppose it is true up to some error margin of C. There is some number C. C may be negative. I'm not saying anything about the sign of C. Similarly, suppose my uh, homogeneity or two homogeneity is only true up to some C prime. And again, C prime can be positive or negative. Then for any alpha beta in my group, the length of the commutator is less than 4C plus 5C prime. There is no dependence on alpha and beta. It's a uniform upper bound. That's the main theorem, if you will. And the above proof, of course, uses that the length function is non-negative and the constants here are exactly zero, so that this is an equality and less equals here. But here we have, in this result, we have far weaker hypotheses. The length function need not be non-negative. 
functions, any real value function. C, C prime, length of one need not be zero. The length of G need not be length of G inverse. And nevertheless, you get this quantitative estimate. So that leads actually to some quantitative applications in geometry involving something called a stable commutator length. And I will refer you to the paper for details because I'm not an expert. Uh, so maybe it is 1130, so uh, maybe it's, I should probably stop here. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Hey, let it, thanks. Uh, Comments, questions? Any comments, questions? And I know this is a very different audience. I mean, this is not a Lie algebra seminar, which is <laughs> normally I have talked about something about Lie algebra. But I was talking to Slava and he suggested maybe this is a very accessible talk so I to present this one instead. Something similar for other algebraic structures. So in semi-groups, you told nothing interesting, right? Uh, in monoids, in fact. In monoids, it, if, if you take any free monoid, then it always exists. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to use something called the Levenstein metric. Uh, so if you have a ring structure, anything reasonable? Uh, I mean, no, I have no idea. So I don't think people have looked at that. People have. There was a paper recently that actually used this to prove something, uh, uh, where they looked at. Uh, I forget exactly what they were looking at the norm structure, but only if. Uh, only for some special elements inside there, not for all elements. Yeah, Lie algebra speed is the closest next object to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, there are there is a bracket here. I don't know what bracket there, but uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. That was very very enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lala. Thank you. No questions, comments. Yeah, I'll stop presenting. Okay, very good. Very good talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for uh, inviting me. And hopefully, you know, hopefully the pandemic, once it gets over, uh, mm -hmm. I can probably try to visit Slava as well at some point. And maybe some there are many things in chat. You can see many. Oh, uh, there is a chat. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Irina, and everyone as well. Okay. Very nice for us. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yes. I'm sure this is a very different talk from the algebra. <laughs> from the next next your next week's talk will be very different again. Probably to this one. Is this <laughs> is this your university department talk as well? Now? Is a seminar as well now? The leisure seminar. Because I saw that the leisure seminar of course is the offline version, but this year it's all on. This is the online. No offline. No, no offline. No, okay. only online. Okay, very good. Okay, very really nice talk. Thank you very much for Thank you. this Thank you. talk. And if no more questions, comments, let's thank you. Thank again, Apollo. Oh. Very very. And, uh, yes, yes. and I will make announcement for the next talk. The next Thursday, we will have a talk by Professor Kang Xiok Jin from Korea Institute, Korea Research Institute of Arts and Mathematics, and he will speak on quantum Borchert's Bosek algebras and abstract crystals. So, see you. And, and we have another one. Tomorrow? Ah, one more? Excuse me. There are two talks. There are, there are. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is, it will be, this is at, four, at four or at, at two o'clock as usual. No, this is in the morning. Ah, sorry. Let me see.
Владимир Бугула from Sheffield. Oh. So, let me see. At 12, we have the talk by Kang uh, Seok Nam, Kang Seok Jim, Quantum Warhead Borsic Algebras and Abstract Crystals. And at 2, we will have a talk by Vladimir Baula. Slava, do you remember the title? Mm, no. Just a moment. Just a moment. Uh, ah, it's to be announced <laughs> in my... No, it's already known, but uh, but it will be announced. Yeah, I okay, can... I can uh, the global dimension of the algebras of polynomial integral differential operators and Jacobian algebras. And uh, another observation, Kang talks is at 10, 10 a.m. Since it's in Korea, it will be at 10 p.m., I believe, in Korea. So it's at 10, not at 12. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, one more. The Korea first talk by Kang Seong Jing will be at 10, at 10, at 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock, because of Korea, yes, 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 at 10 o'clock. And the second is your unusual time at 14. Now everything is correct? Yes. The first speaker will Professor Kang Seong Jing, and the second, Professor Vladimir Bavulo. Okay. Thanks to everybody for, for coming, for participating. And till the next session. Bye bye.